This is the white oak lumber that I'm going to use for the trim. It's very dusty. Let me turn it over. This is over two inches thick, uh, about eight inches wide, nine feet long. And I'll tell you, that is heavy. I had to climb up to the lumber rack to get it. Extremely heavy. So it's very nice lumber, very heavy, very dense. I love working with this stuff. It's nice to work with. But I'm going to be making a series of rip cuts. And a rip cut is differentiated from a cross cut. A cross cut goes across the grain, as you might imagine. A rip cut goes with the grain. Those are two very different cuts. Across the grain, that's far easier to do. And that's because you're, you're severing the fibers of the wood with your blade, like that. A rip cut, you're going with the fibers, you're cutting them with the fibers, and they, they tend to, to mush up and, and fuzz out and stuff. They don't sever nearly as easily as they do when you're doing a cross cut. So you should use a different blade for a rip cut, and that blade is the rip blade. It has fewer teeth, larger teeth, more space between the teeth for the uh, sawdust, the wood chips and the sawdust to leave. And so that's what we're going to put in the saw to do the rip cuts on this oak plank.
Okay, time to go to school on white oak. This is just such beautiful stuff, I can't say enough how much I like working with it. The smell in here is incredible. That nice nutty smell. I want to show you about medullary rays, or what some people call ray fleck, and grain direction. I've cut that so that I can use what's called quarter sawn grain. This is the kind of grain pattern that you're accustomed to seeing. This is called a flat sawn grain, where you get those cathedrals and you get the, the grain going across like this. And this is what I want to use. This is called quarter sawn grain. You see these patterns in this white oak? This is uh, this is the ray fleck. This, these are medullary rays. Don't ask me why they're called that or what that means, I don't know. Let me show you the end of this and it'll start to make more sense. So, you can see the tree rings here, okay? So when you cut white oak uh, across the tree rings this way, normally when you cut lumber, you cut it uh, fairly flat across the, uh, with the tree rings this way. It's more economical, you can get more lumber out of a tree. Uh, so then lumber cut like that is cheaper. If you cut it in a quarter sawn direction across the tree rings, you'll get these medullary rays, these ray flecks. It doesn't show up very much right here, but it will. You can see them a bit there. So that's Oak Lumber 101. I've got two thicknesses here. I've got some that are about three quarter, and I've got some that are about an inch and a quarter. There's going to be two depths of trim on this project, and I'll explain that in a little bit as to why. Uh, I just have to uh, keep milling some lumber here. And you can see this is a three horsepower saw, and you could hear it kind of slowing down a little bit going through there. It's a fairly sharp blade. It could be sharper. You need to keep moving. I paused a little bit here, so it burned. Uh, miter saw, I paused a little bit when I was cutting it off, so it burned. Uh, so it burns, I wouldn't say easily, but it will burn. Maple burns easier. Cherry burns terribly easily. Uh, so anyway, that's, that's my... Some of my trim pieces, I'm not sure that'll be enough.
Welcome back to the bed build. This is where things get interesting. Kind of fun actually. It's nice that I get to work with white oak lumber. I just, I just love working with it. It's, uh, it smells so good. We've got the nice sawdust here. It's, it's a nutty smell. It's beautiful. It mills so nice, it works so nice, it looks so beautiful, especially when you get that stain and the finish on it. Uh, you'll have to wait. I know it's coming, but you'll have to wait to see what I mean. So I've, tr I've cut all of my trim here. So I've got four pieces that are about 13 sixteenths by inch. Yeah, this will this will be going on in this orientation. You see the grain in the end of this, okay? So the the grain should be more or less horizontal when it's installed. So that's how I can easily tell if I'm doing this correctly. Just look at the end grain. You can tell a little bit by the by the face. However, in such a narrow piece, sometimes it's hard to see a, a quarter sawn grain from a flat sawn grain. But looking at the end, I know that's wrong. Okay, these are inch by about 13 16 so they're slightly uh, more shallow than they are deep. And those are the, the tops, the top of the trim there. Then we have these little styles. These are called styles. On a door, these are called styles that uh, go on the ends of the plywood vertically. And I have some similar pieces that go on again the grain so that goes on this way on the bottom of the cabinet okay so these are these are all a bit over length these are all cut to uh, dimension uh, thickness and width and they're over length by a little bit and when we fit these on uh, we're going to be cutting those exactly to length I've got the way I had to do this the good news is I got this all out about four feet of, of uh, lumber. So that's really nice. This is expensive lumber. I've got uh, over five feet left on this big plank that I started with. It was tough to cut that big plank in half, you know, to start with, but I had to. What I've got left here, because I, I have to kind of rough size it and then start cutting things exactly to dimension, I've got all of these little pieces here that are pretty uniform thickness the small pieces and the larger pieces longer ones here uh, so you know those will make perfect plywood edging for another project so I'm hang on to those and that's kind of the trouble with a wood shop is your wood shop fills up with off cuts that are good for something someday but that's exactly what's going to happen with these these will make good edging for maybe for a drawer or a cabinet or a cupboard door or some kind of a project. You know, you can you can overkill a project pretty easy, a shop project, by using this material. It looks really over the top, but in actual fact it's scrap. Okay, so here's one of the cabinets. It's right way up. This is the top. This is uh, this is the foot of the bed. So what happens here is this piece, these are just a tiny bit over three quarters wide. So they will fit on there with a slight reveal. It's always easier to fit parts that have a slight reveal than try to line things up perfectly. I, I've done the perfect thing, you know, you can do it. It's just, uh, you know, you usually you'll make a mess more than you'll make it something beautiful. And a reveal gives you a little shadow line. It looks really good. Now this is going to have to be flush on top, right? So that you can, when you slide bins in and out, you're not going to have an edge to catch on here. Uh, so that I'm going to have to do just right. The bottom will have a slight reveal, which doesn't matter. The reveal really comes in on the styles. On a door, the horizontals are called rails. On the uh, the verticals are called styles. A little bit of chip out on this piece here. 
I'm gonna put a, I'm gonna, it's too bad, it's nicely figured. But I'm gonna put an X here so I don't end up installing that on the outside. Okay, so these little styles then fit here, and that's where this little reveal comes in. It's got a very slight overhang on each side, I can feel it. Okay, so they'll go there. There's three on each side of each cabinet, so there's six in all. And again, as I mentioned, these are all cut over length, so those will be trimmed to fit perfectly between the bottom rail and the top rail. The top rail is one inch because that one inch is required to make the bed 76 inches wide. That again should be as flush as possible. It's not going to be something you see or feel uh, until you're making the bed. This will all be sanded real nice because you're going to be tucking your sheets in under here. <clears throat> so that'll go like that and then the, the little style goes in in between here. So this, this trim is one inch, this trim is half inch. A little bit of a difference there. Which is, you know, just a design element. And again, if I flush this in, it's cut over size. So I'll need to trim that just perfectly for the application. And that's what I'm doing. So this mostly glues on. Glue and clamps. And it's a really good glue, so we should be fine there. I've done this before a number of times. Here's a little trick. This trim is going to be glued on here. Glue is uh, kind of slippery. You clamp it and invariably you clamp it and then it'll slide around. You know, if this slides around and gives me too much reveal, I do have an option. I can run my sander, I can run my router bit and face that off. That's not the end of the world. But here's a trick. I've taken some of my tiny nails and I've tapped that in here, right here near the end. And I've tapped it in most of the way. Now I can cut it off with my side cutter. Okay, shield it so it doesn't go in my eyes. Now what I've got is I've got a rather sharp little point there. When I take my trim and I clamp it there, that little nail will grab into the trim, keep it from sliding around. I don't need a lot of these. I really only need, you know, well, I need at least three. One in the middle, one on each end. So, just take them in. If you can drive a nail. You drive it in most of the way, leave enough out you can cut off. Drive it the right way. Drive it so that the sharp end goes in first. Well, that was the sharp end. Okay. Don't cut it off too short. Your clamps will pull it farther in. It's just plywood. It's not hard to drive in there. But just cut it off so there's two millimeters protruding. See how I use metric there? Okay, one of the rules, one of the things to achieve with the woodworking is try to do as few, take care of as few things as possible. You know, try to do one thing at a time. So I can line this up and uh, get my glue on, get my clamps on, and make it all just perfect the way I want. Decide which face I want out. And they're both equally as beautiful. So I think I might try and line up that corner when I'm doing this. This is where you actually want quite a bit of glue. You're going to have drip, you're going to have squeeze out. That's one reason I think to do the top first so it's not dripping on your bottom. But I'll likely turn it over 
No, I won't turn it over because I want to line the top of the bottom piece up so I need to see it. Okay. This glue boasts a high initial tack, so we're going to get to it. Put some protective cloth down. Don't make too much of a mess of the table saw. Alright, here we go. This one I'll put on just as a, a placeholder. Doesn't have to be perfect, just has to hold it up there. And if you have a slight reveal you don't want, that's okay. Better than a deficit there because you can always trim that sander, router, whatever. You know, your exact height, your exact reveal on the bottom really is inconsequential. This actually turned out really good too. So this is really going to be the slow part of this whole job, I think. Because of the consumption of clamps. Clamps are expensive, so we usually are trying to conserve them. Oh, I'm getting glue on the finished surface, I haven't stained yet. This is my little Stanley flush cut saw. And you see it says this side up. So what happens is these little teeth uh, usually on a saw the set on the teeth goes both ways it, it cuts a little bit wider than the than the uh, saw itself or the blade but these the, the the saw teeth come up only they're they're straight and they're up so what you can do is you can cut on a surface like this you can cut something off flush and this is a pole saw though I have broke it here because I'm not accustomed to using a pole saw so you can break that little blade easy uh, so you have to cut it you have to pull it and reset it and pull it and reset it like that what is handy for stuff like this is uh, a little block plane this is also a Stanley this is not very expensive set it up right keep it sharp and it'll really serve you well tack hammer in a bundle of tools I bought from a guy that's a Stanley too <laughs> and I'd never had one of those before but it's it ever nice and you want to do a small job like this I use it when I'm assembling my frames you don't need the power of a big hammer it's easy to control it doesn't uh, bash the crap out of your project or your fingers you miss a nail and hit your finger with that it just hurts a whole lot less than a standard size hammer Put the nails in before you put the piece on. Bet you wouldn't have guessed that.
Sometimes you hear, you read people talking about, no, oh, don't spread glue with your finger, oil off your finger, yada, yada, yada. Well, well, people make up a lot of stuff. People repeat a lot of stuff that somebody says too, you know. Come on. Work in this sawdust and, and you hear glue and all kinds of things. There's not a lot of oil in my hands even if it would cause a problem, and I don't think it would. Doesn't matter which end I line it up with, I'll regret it equally. I'm going to start with this one. That's a tiny reveal. I can just skin that off later. You could do that with a hand plane. Probably not with a block plane. Probably something a little longer that would uh, give you a, a flat, more of a flat surface. Planes, hand planes, are what they used before they had routers. Routers are the power tools that clear up the hand planes. So just, actually that's flush, that's beautiful. And a little reveal on the bottom. Nice. Tiny squeeze out. It's exactly what you want because that means your your glue joint is full. I don't see squeeze out here, so that makes me think maybe I need another clamp there. A bit more clamps. They're different styles. I like these. They they grab really tight. This one's tight enough for this job. Okay, that's tight. Yeah, little squeeze out. Perfect. Okay, so. <laughs> That's where it is for, oh, most of today anyway. What I can do now that this is drying, this is clamped, it's secure, it's tight, not going to move around, is I can hit it with my flush cut saw. And this might be too big a job for this saw, but we'll give it a shot. Again, you have to pull the saw, right? You see I'm making a little bit of a mark there, but it's not cutting into the wood. It's very sharp, so it does cut quite well. And it's extremely uh, narrow kerf saw. So I'm finding a good way to cut something nice and straight like that. This you want to get just right, and mostly on the other side, because the other side is going to match or mate up to the other cabinet. You don't want a big gap in there. I'm still not accustomed to using this quickly like that. I have to think about that pulling motion. This is going to need TLC once it's cut. that a little bit. I'm continuing on to apply this oak trim. I'm a little bummed about the 
decision that I've just kind of been forced into making. This trim needs to go on here. Just, the bed is upside down. It needs to go on here flush with what's the top and then a slight reveal on the bottom. What I'm bummed about is I'm kind of being forced into using nails. I've got an 18 gauge nailer here. The big decision here is how do I clamp this? With the top piece I could clamp it because there's a, a small six inch plywood strip here. I could clamp that pretty easily. And that went on well and they're, they're nicely adhered by now. With this piece that's a 74 inch clamp plus 75, 76 inch clamp. Uh, I have I have only two clamps. They're big pipe clamps that are that long. Uh, so that means I would have to use a call. What a call is, is because you need clamping pressure. You can't just have one clamp here, one clamp there. You know, because because wood bends, right? And you wouldn't get any pressure at other points here. So your glue wouldn't be pushed right in and, and go to adhere properly. So a call, is a, and this, this is not big enough, but this is just to illustrate. You take another piece of wood that's large and preferably hardwood because it's much more rigid. You, pre you place that across your, your workpiece and you clamp that. And that call is supposed to then more accurately or more effectively transfer that clamping pressure along it. A couple different problems with that is I don't have scads of this hardwood sitting around. This is very expensive stuff. So I don't have a great big beautiful piece of hardwood that I could use for a call because a proper call for this would be four or five inches thick. Very big piece of wood. I only have two of those clamps, so that makes the call has to be that much bigger to transfer that clamping pressure. Even if I had that call, uh, doing this by yourself is pretty difficult because you've got to line up your you've got to line up your trim piece perfectly, right? And we've we've used the little nail trick. We put a little nail cut the top off it and that, and that helps a lot for sure. Uh, so you've got to line your trim up then you have to get your call in place and you have to get your big heavy clamp in place and then you have to get everything tightened up. And that is just too many ifs, too many variables for my comfort. So I'm going to jam out and use nails. I'm going to put some glue on this and, uh, and nail it on. You know, a little bit of wood filler at the end. Will you see it? I don't know. Maybe. Maybe not. I'll stop crying the blues here and just do it now. trim here. That's not good. I put the glue on the workpiece last time, didn't I? So it would be horizontal, not vertical. It's plywood, you gotta put a lot of glue on plywood, it really soaks it up. It's always plywood is always half end grain. The end grain really soaks up glue. Alright, now I've, I've burned this a little bit on the saw. It's pretty hard to, to not have any burn marks, so I'm going to just apply it in this orientation. Uh, yeah, it's just kind of a, it's not the best day. It's kind of hard to do. I'll try and line it up here nice and flush. 
flush with the the top, which is the bottom. <laughs> and cloth. Try to get it lined up nicely. Shoot a nail in it. Nails it is. Nail blew out the power. Hope I didn't have any blowout inside the case. You can tell I don't do this for a living. Okay. So of course the big advantage to nails is It's on, it's on. I can continue here. I don't need to wait before I unclamp everything so I can move on to the next stage. So, I mean, you know, everything's got a silver lining. It's not what I want it to do, but kind of just the best comp. It's kind of like beekeeping, isn't it? It's just the compromise you can live with. I just applied this trim. I need to knock some of these corners down. The sharp and uh, the sharper they are, the more likely they're going to get damaged and splinter out. So I've got a sanding block here that I made some time ago, years ago, and all it is is a belt sanding, a belt sander belt wrapped around a piece of wood that's cut just right to fit, nice and tight, just a piece of two by four or something, and that's the handiest thing there is. corners off so they're not sharp and they don't crack and splinter. Of course these are exactly the same length and there's a reveal on the bottom. Raise it a little. Okay, so bottom trim. Just like that. Bang, bang, Bob's your uncle. That is your aunt, I guess. <laughs>
a nice figure in this piece right here. Look at that. That's gonna really pop when you uh, when I put the stain on. I don't have any tiny nails. I don't buy nails. I buy nails for my air nailer. I buy screws. I don't ever buy nails. So I have to cut these apart to get some little nails. Kind of weird, eh? Then I have to try and drive one of these with my hammer, which is really not that hard. Not in plywood. Plywood is very easy to drive an and do this way. Honestly, I don't need to drive it very far. Uh, they're just locating. Ford five clamps if I want to do the other side. I think that's if this clamp is kind of worn, I would just grab it. But I've got to squeeze out the whole way along, and that's what matters.